Hey everyone, so I am joined by Wendell from Level 1 Techs, and we are embarking on part two of our journey to build a server. So it's pretty cool stuff. We have basically a, a kind of a, a host box, a computer that we just assembled in the CS381 from Silverstone. It had a lot of small issues along the way. We talked about that in part one. We ran into some challenges. We have a couple of other highlights, cool motherboard that's got an interface we can access from other computers, even for BIOS. And then you also brought with you a disk shelf. Yep that we can hook into the whole setup. So part two, what we're doing right now, is going to be defining the problems we're trying to solve and setting up the software side of things, yep. Unraid in this case. It's really a coming of age story. Uh, a server bar mitzvah, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that will start us for part two. Before that, this video is brought to you by Linode Cloud Computing. We've trusted Linode as our web host since 2012 and recommend it for excellent technical and customer support reliable uptime, and a clean interface. Aside from cloud hosting, Linode.com recently added GPU hosting plans for machine learning and neural net use, built with RTX 6000 GPUs and 10 gigabit per second network speeds. They're also starting to deploy Epic CPUs in their servers. Sign up for Linode.com cloud computing with code GNEXUS20 for a $20 credit or click the link in the description below to visit Linode.com slash GamersNexus. So let's, let's start this one. We'll Define the things I'm trying to solve. It's what uh, our workflow, I guess. I'll go through the workflow briefly. Well, not just the workflow, the equipment you have now. It's just a big old stack of hard drives plugged into the network. Yes. That's not optimal. No, <laughs> it's not. We film a video. All the video goes from the SD cards to straight through a computer, like an editing computer, onto the NAS, Synology NAS. And then that project is edited off the NAS. And eventually, those files are compressed, if they're B-roll, if they're A-roll, they're deleted. And then I guess other use cases, we store test data on there. So I've got an isolated testing folder and uh, isolated folder for media production. And so... <laughs> you were telling me about uh, there was a mouse button that was mapped to accidentally delete folders? Yes, not accidentally. Andrew used to map his mouse 4 to delete. You still have something mouse to, uh, mapped to delete. OK, so now it's mapped to only work in Premiere. But the first time I realized that, or one of the first times I remembered it, was when I was browsing the server folders. And I, I went in the wrong one. I wanted to click mouse 4 to go back. So that's the hotkey for back. And it started deleting in 2018. So snapshots are going to be important <laughs> for the solution that we deploy. Yeah. So what I'm using now, in that instance, one, you go fucking click cancel really <laughs> fast. And then two is uh, I've got a recycling bin set up on Synology's side. So I can restore stuff if that happens, or we've got isolated user accounts, so certain permissions for testing versus media. That way, there's no accidents that are like company wide, just one group. <laughs> and yeah, so some kind of recycling bin equivalent would be good just for mistakes like that. Also, the other nice thing about having a server, especially when you're like sort of graduating into the server being able to do stuff is that it can do double duty. Like right now, I think you've got a dedicated machine for transcoding. Like yes. when you get low on space, you'll do transcoding. But also things like Steam cache for games, like your workload, that, that might not help a little bit, but maybe the internet cache does. Mm. But you can also run virtual machines, like full virtual machines on your uh, server system if it's powerful enough. Now, the Synology stuff can do that as well, but it's not really super powerful. No. Like you're really pushing it to the ragged edge, asking it to do all those things. There's a lot of limitations for stuff like memory capacity. Yeah. And also, whatever CPU is in there is what you get. It's not, not like it's socketed. Yeah. So yes, uh, so there's a lot of options. Steam cache is a cool idea, too. Like I, I was saying off camera, but we, we, we don't really download games that much. We kind of pull all the ones we need for testing, keep them on dedicated test drives. but. If a new game comes out, we probably need to download it two to four times. This way you can ensure that you only download it once and then everything else happens at wire speed. Mm -hmm. And with the 10 gig interfaces, you know, multiple machines can be pulling from that. And honestly, the bottleneck is probably going to be decompression rather than network speed. Mm. Yeah. Well, the virtualization also means that if a workload comes along and you want to experiment with it, you could experiment with in a virtual machine on one of your workstations mm. or just create a new virtual machine on the server, experiment with it there, and if it pans out, great. And if not, just wipe the virtual machine. Oh, there's one more that just reminded me of is uh, image hosting. Oh, yeah. So for pulling down images for test systems, right now we just clone drives on a, on a machine. And what I used when I worked at Dell, what we did was we used Ghost 32, mm -hmm. Norton product. 
And it works great. You boot into Pixie Boot, and then you navigate the server. So you boot over Ethernet to some server in a closet somewhere, pull down the image that you built maybe the previous couple days, and just load it onto 10 different laptops that are all the same SKU. Yep. And so that would be nice to have an image store. Yeah, we can create a virtual machine to do that and to do the PXE boot. There's a couple little things we'll have to reconfigure on the router, but once that's set, you will be able to boot off the network. Mm. It's pretty neat. It's neat yes. stuff. Yes, very cool. So we've got the use cases defined. If you didn't know some of that stuff was really possible or hadn't thought of it, that gives you some ideas. Um, let's uh, let's get started with setup, I guess. We, we previously just put Unraid on a USB key. Mm -hmm. It is in the server now. And uh, you said I'm, I'm going to need that, I guess that key stays in there yep. permanently? OK. Yep. Is that why? <laughs> That's what Unraid actually runs from. Okay. So Unraid will boot and run from the USB key, and that's to tolerate any kind of changes that you might want to do to the disks. And that chassis has four empty slots for mechanical drives, one empty slot for NVMe, mm. but the disk shelf also has 12 empty slots. Okay. So Yes, we have uh, expandability for the shelf, for yeah. sure. So if you want to add 10 more drives, you can, or two, or one, right. Or, right. or whatever. Okay, cool. So the first thing is Unraid comes up in trial mode. It is paid software. Unraid is really, I tested Unraid in ZFS, so I'm going to have a separate video on that about like why and about six different systems, but really Unraid versus uh, FreeNAS. And FreeNAS was problematic for me booting on Threadripper with the newest Agiza on every Threadripper system I had it hung, and that was disconcerting. Mm. And uh, it doesn't do hardware pass through. I really like hardware pass-through. Turns yeah. out I do a lot of content on, I'm going to sequester Windows to a VM, and now I trust it to run. And then I, I'm out here in the real world with Linux doing actual work, and then Windows can have its little sandbox where it's eating paste and whatever else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, eating paste and installing malware in the background. I don't know why Candy Crush keeps coming back. <laughs> why does this keep happening? So we're going to do get trial key because we don't care. And it's going to hit the internet, and that's basically it. And uh, I should mention, we don't have the disk shelf connected right now. Yeah, just the 14 terabyte disks. Although I don't see the NVMe. Maybe we need to go toggle something on, or we bumped it or something earlier. Might need to toggle it might be, in BIOS. Might be in a different, uh, different area. No, that's not it. If you want it all as part of the same pool, then. Because it, it won't let you do anything until you start, you start an array, mm -hmm. and, the, and the ZFS pool doesn't count as an array. So we, use, we end up using the NVMe. With ZFS, you just, a ZFS pool can be made of one or more VDEVs, mm -hmm. and each VDEV is responsible for its own redundancy. Okay. If you lose one VDEV, you lose the entire pool. Okay. So the 14 terabytes would be one VDEV with one drive of redundancy, and we have 12 drives. So I'd probably split that into two VDEVs of six drives with one or two drives of redundancy each. So we'll have three VDEVs. And as ZFS uses the disk, it runs performance counters. And so that'll figure out how fast each VDEV is. Okay. And based on how fast each VDEV is, it will balance the read and write loads across them. And then uh, from the user interface end, how is that interpreted as far as folder structure, file structure? You, you get to pick okay. how you want things. So it sounds like you need at least two shares, mm -hmm. but you could even create individual user shares, give them a quota. So like every, okay. every user here could have their own user and password, and you could give them, say, you know, a terabyte of space. Right. And then it's like, you need to clean up your stuff because this doesn't work. We've also got uh, flash and spinning rust. And so we'll probably split the flash into its own storage. And that can be like a work area. It's yeah. always guaranteed to be fast. But later, we can add flash devices to use as caching if we want. And then and this can be cut if we need to for time. But And then uh, for, for that working area, so if we have active projects, is this an issue where we just need to get into the, the habit of manually moving the project over to the We can discs? automate it all. I was going to say, is, or is there like a run a cleanup weekly or something and just move? Yeah, I think um, because your storage pool is so large compared to the amount of flash storage that you have, we can just set it up nightly at like 2 or 3 in the, in the morning to low priority, uh, do an rsync to a folder on spinning rust. Okay. So then if something does happen to the flash, You've got last night's copy or whatever, but right. generally you work from that, and you would only go to that sequestered area if something really bad happened. Right. Yeah, and and then just uh, I guess delete it once the project is done. 
It, well, that can be scheduled as well, because if you remove it, we can enforce deletes. Mm -hmm. So if somebody removes it here, then the following night, that will also be removed from the spinning rust area. Okay. So you All don't right. have to think about it. Cool. So we took a, a quick intermission to get the drive working. We had the switch drives. The other one was a SATA drive, so we swapped it out for NVMe. And now we're back on this page. Basically, this is going to be throwaway. And so we're just going to create that. Uh, okay. Unrate is weird because it eschews, like, I get it, because like BTRFS was not trustworthy there for a while. Mm. It's gotten better. Some of the other file systems are a little sketch. And the approach like that the Synology takes is to use the Linux MD plus LVM, and it creates a zillion LVM slices on MD. And then when you add another disk to the mix, it can sort of rebalance how things are done. Can I ask a question? Uh huh. What is LVM? Oh, uh, it's a logical volume manager. So okay, like, got it. it okay, uh, I'm with you. Yeah, it's like the partition manager on steroids yeah, for Linux. Yeah. So, um, Unraid takes a different approach. Unraid wants you to explicitly set parity drives, like one or two parity drives, and then your data drives. Okay. And then there's a little program that watches everything you do and make sure that there's multiple copies of your file. So when uh, we were talking about snapshots earlier on the Unraid forums, it's like, oh, if you use BTRFS, make sure that all of the drives in your pool use snapshotting. Otherwise, some of your files will be snapshotted and some of them won't. Mm. And this is a very odd way to approach that problem as someone who is an outsider, perhaps, to the Unraid community. Mm. So not a philosophically, I have a lot of problems with that choice. Yeah. But, you know, this ticks all the boxes, so we're going to use this. Okay. Next step is really to just start start the array. And it's just the one thing participating in this, but now we've sort of activated all the other functionality. Interface looks nice. Yeah, it's pretty clean. It's a little, it's weird because like under VMs, well, we probably have to turn something on, but mm. uh, under VMs and some of the other things, it has some really esoteric features. It's really well built out. But then other things like, I would like to run a task on a schedule. No, you don't get a GUI for that. Okay. So do you just build a cron file for that, or? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I know how to do that at least. So. so. Or I used to anyway. It's annoying. But why? Why do you do this? Why do you do this? All right. Well, so we're waiting on Docker and some other stuff to start, but that's fine. So this is running now, and by default, the flash device is shared on the network, and this is so you can manipulate the configuration over the network. Okay. Or if you want to back up your configuration, you can like once we get this set up, you can literally go copy paste this, and if something happens to the USB drive, you can just make a new one and okay. then just paste it back in. Perfect. The config anyway, and it, you're good to go. But we can see that we've got our drives here, and the temperature is reported. We've got 35, 37, 38, 36. Mm. And how many reads and writes and errors have occurred and things like that. Cool. And that will persist even though it'll, it'll always show as unassigned, but they're actually going to be part of a ZFS pool. Okay. I think the next step is uh, probably to start following the tutorial that's on the, the Level 1 website. Okay. So let me see. Did you write I that? I did. Okay, cool. Uh, do you trust you? Yeah. <laughs> you, think, you think the tutorial is okay? Is it going to be like the next step is rm rf <laughs> copy slash. paste this command <laughs> yeah. into the terminal and then one four eight seven six four. That's freaky though that I responded on that one. I'm bad with long, I'm bad with sequences of numbers as it turns out. That seems. <laughs> Unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> with maintaining the order of sequences of numbers. Sequences of letters and acronyms you're quite good with. <laughs> but numbers, no. That's, that's questionable. <laughs> ZFS on Unraid. Here's how. Bonus shadow copy setup. So shadow copy is this really cool thing in Windows. Um, I'm familiar with the name. So if we look, if we go to, this is just the flash. This doesn't count, but it, it works mm. to show. So the previous versions tab, this is built into Windows, and this is great, and every NAS on planet Earth should use this. Samba has supported this forever on Linux, and so Samba on FreeBSD, Samba on literally everything. Samba that Macs use has a binary extension for handling this. The problem is that just about everything except FreeNAS, and FreeNAS has got an asterisk there because it's not really like super idiot proof out of the box, which is annoying because this is like a basic feature of a NAS that should be on all NAS. I think mm -hmm. the Synology might do this out of the box, but in terms of like the free software, no. And what, what we do is like once this is set up, 
as this creates snapshots, those are going to show up here. So we'll okay. come back to that. Okay. So the first thing we need is the Unraid plugin. And this is the, you know, let's paste on trusted code into the thing. It's, it's fine. That's how I built my first web server. <laughs> Install plugin. You know, what could go wrong? Just paste this link. It's totally fine. Right? So earlier we were making jokes about NSA and Russia and China having back doors into the NAS that we just built. Yeah. But actually it's you and it's all through this <laughs> software. <laughs> I think Steiny84 has a community developer has a has a back door because <laughs> it's uh, GitHub user content dot com slash Steiny1984. So good job. Oh, 1984. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, not Great. ironically, not unironically <laughs> named. <laughs> <laughs> The next plugin is <laughs> GitHub user slash George Orwell. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is uh, this is the uh, the auto snapshot script. Although we're going to modify this a little bit. All right. Uh, what do you want to call your storage tank? You can call it tank. That's pretty common. I called the test one that I brought dumpster, um, a pool, or anything really. Where is it seen? Uh, just on the command line, and like when you get status messages. It'll be like storage pool, whatever. Oh, okay. Is currently experiencing an issue. Okay. Or a scrub. Is it is like running. is it like SDA except for a pool? Yeah. Or well, more accurately, it'd be more like uh, MD zero. Okay. It's like it's MD. It's it's a synthesis of all of your other devices. Okay. Tank is fine, unless you want something different. No, that's fine. I don't 100 percent remember the syntax for that, but it's probably fine. Yeah. Okay. So Z pool status will show you. Pool tank, you know, current stats online, scanned, unrequested, config, and then there's all your stuff. Okay. And so it's like, oh, well, wait. Yeah. So this is RAID Z1, and then you've got... All the disks. Yep. And so... And um, then the um, SSD is not in there yet? No, the, the SSD is going to be part of the unraid system, so it's a different thing. Okay. And th these are just the disks, and we'll add those. And so this could be this is its own VDEV, and so the next VDEV that we add will be like probably RAID Z1 or RAID Z2, mm -hmm. and then it'll list out all the other disks, and they'll have different letters. Okay. And actually, probably when we hook the disk shelf up, up it's going to be multi-path, so it's probably not going to be named A, B, C, D. We'll actually get these really long disk names mm -hmm. because each disk has a globally unique identifier, like a MAC address. And because there's more than one way for the system to get at them, that's handled in the Linux software side through something called multipath. Okay. And so ZFS is smart enough to know, it's like, I just need this disk. I don't care how we get there. Mm. So it's like, I need to take a flight to LA, but I don't care if we go through Chicago or Austin or, okay. or whatever. Got it. I'd prefer not to go through Chicago, but. Yeah, that'd be bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here? Yeah, ORD no, is not great. <laughs> All right, so uh, what's the next step here? Now we need to do testing. So I, I was using FIO to do testing, and so you create I've heard of that you create a too. data set in like your ZFS pool is itself a data set, mm -hmm. but you can create like you would normally think of them as like directories, but it's directories on steroids because you can tell ZFS I plan to put uncompressible stuff in here. Don't bother compressing it. Okay. Or I plan to put you know this kind of data in there, and it will optimize how it stores it and deals with it. And it also has to do with things like write synchronization and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. when you're using FIO, you create a test folder that tells the disks to basically be as conservative as possible because otherwise ZFS is so sophisticated, it'll see that FIO is trying to do a benchmark and it'll optimize away the benchmark so you get false numbers. I see. It's like you're running a benchmark, you're just having me do frivolous stuff. The correct answer is this is really fast. Oh, okay. And so FIO is like, you're really fast. <laughs> so it ends up being a cache benchmark. That's funny. Okay. So you, you turn all that off yeah, and then, yeah. then you run the tests. So then we, once we do all that, we set up ZFS automatic snapshots. So this will be a cron job. And this is the first ingredient for mapping uh, the snapshots to uh, shadow copies on the Windows interface. So even though shadow copy is a Microsoft technology and the snapshot is a ZFS thing, we're going to use this script to create probably like two periodic snapshots mm -hmm. a day and then map those snapshots to the shadow copy interface on Windows to make it easy. Okay. This is a very well written guide. We should. Um, With screenshots. Yeah. And that's what it will look like. We should post a reply and thank this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's good. It's all well formatted and everything. So we'll link this in the description below, I guess. He sent, sent me a link when you're 
ready and if you want to follow this at home uh we're probably going to cut steps in the video yeah because otherwise it'll be too long so it'll all be in his guide okay cool the next thing that we do once we get zfs going is we can start adding virtual machines and docker containers okay so we, and by we, I mean Wendell, did some work on the server further. And we'll have an intermission in here. Again, you can follow his guide if you want the steps that we've skipped in video. But you did some additional setup. And the real reason you'll now know that I brought specifically this man out here to help is because I knew I wouldn't have to give you Star Trek terms yes. for my folder names. Right. So I walked out of the room, and I came back. <laughs> and he's like, look, I made Holodeck and <laughs> Engineering and warp, so it's perfect. Yeah, you mentioned uh, <laughs> you needed two different security levels. Plus, yeah. we've also got the NVMe. So of course, the NVMe share is warp, and then holodeck and engineering are isolated security groups. So the researchers can't bungle the video, and the video can't bungle the researchers. Right. Yeah. But exactly. we've also got extra safeties, which is that shadow copy stuff I was mentioning. So and, and you've got a demo of this already too, I think. Yeah. So like we go in the holodeck share. It's like you copy the Windows ISO there, so we can set up a Windows VM. We'll mm -hmm. look at that in a minute. And it's like, oh no, it's been deleted. Oh no. Uh, so we get the shadow copy from like whenever this is, That's and we exactly open it. Exactly what I sound like when things get deleted. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> it's like this one. This one's not far enough back in time. This is from like eleven. It's like go farther back in time. It's like yeah. oh, there it is. Yeah. So and then we can even open it and show everything's still there. It's still there. We saved it. Yeah. Now, uh, we're still setting up the time zones, so the times are a little funky. Like right. We actually want to use local time and not UTC or California yeah. time. Right. I've noticed your network hands out California time for whatever reason, because obviously we're in California. Yes. Well, so. all tech tubers are there, <laughs> naturally. All roads lead to Los Angeles. Yes. All roads lead to Jay's two cents. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is really cool because um, it's a simple Windows interface. Yeah, you don't even aspect. have to like browse to the web or right. do anything. It's literally built into Windows. And this is what all NAS devices should do. Mm -hmm. Like even like all the free distributions and Unraid's not free. I was really surprised it doesn't easily do this out of the box. Even if you're not running ZFS. I think ZFS's snapshotting capability here is far superior to even BTRFS, ButterFS. Oh, <laughs> engagement challenge. But uh, I, I'm surprised that it doesn't do this somehow <laughs> out of the box. ButterFS was again. Uh, it's like you relate. Why did you relate that to you relate that to, to Facebook yesterday? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's they helped fund a lot of the early development and use it internally okay. because it has some of the features of ZFS, but without all of the overhead and complexity of ZFS. Okay. Because like if you're Facebook and it's like, man, I need a file system that does all this. ZFS ticks the boxes. And then you see that Oracle is involved. I mean, Oracle acquired the intellectual property after oh, okay. it was open source. Of ZFS. Yeah, but okay. again, Oracle, Oracle leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. So, not not the best situation. So ButterFS was an attempt. I feel, at, I feel like, I feel like if Facebook is judging there, they're <laughs> maybe not in a position to do that. But I understand. And ZFS on Linux is now a very mature project. So this is pretty decent. I mean it's well the so again the interface has been you did show me uh, some what did you call it? Uh, I don't know you showed me some aspects where the interface is a bit bipolar on what it offers you. Oh yeah so like depth. the VMs like check it out. So we're gonna add VMs and it's you've got all this stuff and it's crazy. Yes, like I'm always talking nice. about IOMMU and hardware pass through and we set that up and there's a great interface for that. And all you do is I guess load the ISO and onto the server or something? Yeah, and it will let you get at the, like this user interface, a lot of other people could learn from Unraid's interface here because like if I'm gonna edit, this is our Windows VM that's set up mm -hmm. and we can access it through VNC, but we've also got hardware pass through for the Navi GPU. Now we still get the reset bug, so if anything goes wrong, we have to like turn it off, turn it back on, because that's just Navi. Right. But there's this form GUI, and like GUIs for manipulating VMs is, is not great sometimes. But this interface is like, all right, just let me switch over and deal with this at the XML level. This is great. Like yeah, a lot of people yeah. could learn from this. But then it's like, I want to set up a scheduled task to, you know, check the ZFS health or a scheduled task to restart the Docker containers or a scheduled task to do whatever. And there's nothing. There's no there's no interface for setting up scheduled tasks. So it's a little it's like this part is really sophisticated. This part is rock dumb simple. And it's just Yeah. Why? Let's I learned a couple things from you off camera we should go over. So some of the specific naming terminology, containerization of things. 
So just to, I guess, recap, I don't remember how much of this we've gone over at this point, but uh, containerization, as I'll call it, and you can correct me if that's not the right word, but we've got a pool, and then there is a VDEV mm -hmm. under that. And uh, VDEVs, what does that stand for again? It's like a, a virtual device, or mm -hmm. it's, it's really just the, com the building blocks that make up a storage pool. And so with ZFS, you add storage of VDEV at a time. And, and then, that, yeah, and what you were, if I remember this correctly, I think it's if I go to add, let's say, four more drives, then that becomes a VDEV. Yep. And then that VDEV is responsible for its own redundancy. Yep. So if a drive fails on VDEV1 and on VDEV2, there's no relationship between that failure. Yep. Other than maybe you got a bad batch, in which case. Yeah, it better get replacing yeah. those drives. <laughs> but there's no. Yeah, in un or in a in terms of how they're contained, you can replace one drive in each one, and also it, if we have one disk failure for DV, VDEV one, one disk failure for VDEV two, that doesn't mean we have two disk failure. Yep. So, and you can mix one and two drive failures. So, like with the external disk shelf, we can run RAID Z two and have two failures in any of the VDEVs that are implemented with RAID mm -hmm. Z two, and you can mix and match, and it's basically okay. It's not. It's usually better to like do some planning for performance reasons, but generally the more VDEVs you have, the more uh, performance you get. I think there is also, did you use the, was it data set? Was that the other term? Yeah, so with ZFS, like the file system is ZFS, but then you can create a ZFS data set under the file system. Mm -hmm. And the data set can have a bunch of tunables. So uh, we've got a data set for your Docker containers, and your Docker containers are like super lightweight virtual machines. And we're using that for Steam caching, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Mm. But that file system is case sensitive because it's more like Linux. Whereas the engineering share and the warp share, uh, those are case insensitive because you're going to be mostly using Windows clients to mm. access it. And while SMB will preserve case, it's supposed to be case insensitive. So having those data sets mean that you don't have to have different partitions with different parameters. I can say this data set is case sensitive, this data set is case insensitive, right. and they all share the same pool of storage. And so this is the Docker functionality of Unraid, which is pretty good, although it's a little idiosyncratic. And uh, I wasn't planning on doing a tutorial on setting up like a LAN cache, which is like the Steam cache, but mm -hmm. it's a Steam cache that supports Origin and Battle.net and Windows, Windows updates update, yeah. and a whole bunch of things. Windows Update supports uh, caching Windows updates <laughs> and then propagates them to every device on your network. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I guess that's fine. Um, <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, it does support it. But this, yeah, we can do a, so I guess to kind of step back a second, uh, caching things like downloads from Steam is just useful because then, like we were, you were saying earlier, you're operating at cable speed through yeah. the wall or, or whatever your other you know, disk speed. Yeah, limitation. I think Borderlands 3 had like a 20 or 25 gig update. And, uh, you know, if you're on a LAN with three or four other computers mm -hmm. and like downloading that Borderlands 3 update on a bunch of computers, it's just going to kill the connection no matter what kind of connection you have. Yeah, yeah. So even if you're at home or if you... Uh, have people over to play games, kind of LAN party style. It could be useful. I think, I think PDX LAN might actually do something like this too, yes. like a Steam cache, yeah. specifically for that reason because they have however many hundreds of people there. Yeah, Valve has actually been really good about supporting this kind of technology. They have a thing called a site license, where you can, if if you're if you're worthy, uh, Steam will give you a site license, and it'll actually let you cache even games you don't have. Oh, cool. So it'll just download the entire catalog of, okay. of Steam, everything. Well, so that, that makes sense for a LAN event because the LAN event organizers don't have all the games. Yeah. But all the people there will. So, yeah. cool. And uh, this, is, this is nice versus a full virtual machine, too, because these uh, the operating system and the containers uh, are in close communication about what kind of resources they need. So instead of like pre-allocating, say, eight gigabytes of memory for the Windows VM, that's the, you know four or eight gigs or whatever, mm -hmm. as we have the Windows VM, these will just use what they need. And then when they're not busy or there's not a lot going on, they use less memory, and that'll free memory for the host to be used for file system transfer, caching, or whatever. There was something you you mentioned yesterday that you spent some time troubleshooting something, and you said. I might update the tutorial for this because nobody should have to go through this. Do you remember <laughs> what that was? So, um, Nginx, which is the like this web interface, mm -hmm. listens on all IP addresses by default. And in the GUI here for Unraid, um, I've got this LAN cache container, 
And the Langcache container actually wants to listen on port 443, which is encrypted, mm -hmm. and the SNI proxy, which is encrypted. So with the encrypted traffic, with what we're doing here with the caching, if Steam or somebody uh, elects to use an encrypted connection, we can't actually cache that. But we need a mechanism to just send the encrypted traffic on to where it needs to go to. Oh, right, and let the computer. Yeah, without messing with it. With it. So um, for some reason, the Docker GUI here, even if you you can specify by IP address, but you can't share an IP address b between containers. But from the Docker command line, you can. Mm. But um, one of the problems I ran into is that the Nginx proxy was listening on these ports and adding another IP address to the machine meant that this web GUI also used that IP address. There's a workaround for that in the web GUI, but it means you still can't share IP addresses between containers, which is uh, an, a misimplementation, I think, on Unraid's part. But the tutorial, I think I'll update to include that if you're gonna do that, because we've got all three containers running here, which is, it, if like you go to do this and you just drag and drop, it won't do that. It'll be like, I can't start this one because that one's running or vice versa. Yeah, right. Uh, what else do we want to show on the interface? A VM, I guess we could show the if it's still there. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. So you've got a Windows VM set up. Yeah, and this is going to run your uh, transcoder with mm. with a right now 5700 XT, maybe eventually a 10 series mm. NVIDIA card with the code 43 workaround because NVIDIA is like oh VMs, oh, but you can work around it with this setup. So that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, so we can continue using our existing scripts and not rewrite them. Yeah, and one machine is now doing the duty of what was previously two machines. So the electric electricity savings alone. E well, yeah, and the space savings is always my biggest thing because if we can compress multiple machines into one box, uh, that's always better. But the really awesome thing about this uh, 5700 XT is that it can do multiple H.265 streams in real time. I think probably like two 60 FPS streams. Okay. I was doing some testing with uh, Adam uh, Eposvox, yeah. and I think we, we got two 60 FPS H.265 streams. So it's like Navi's encoder is unlocked. It's a little sketchy with the H.264 encoder. They've been working on fixing some bugs around H.264, but mostly what you're doing with the script look like H.264 to H.265. So that should be a good use case if Handbrake can use the hardware in Navi. Yeah, right. Yeah. And if not Handbrake, something can. There's options, and we can rewrite it if necessary. Handbrake CLI was just what we happened to use because it was accessible, and I was familiar with the interface, so it was easy to kind of just spawn the flags and then copy-paste them. A VM that we plan to add here is a, a Linux VM running Fog, which will enable PXE boot, yes. and uh, with PXE boot, um, you'll be able to boot from the network and do imaging and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so being able to boot over Ethernet, basically, as one of the boot devices in BIOS, and then you can go grab images off a server, which we talked about previously. Yeah. And some of the magic here also requires a little bit of reconfiguration on your DHCP server mm -hmm. to use this for DNS so that caching works. But, again, tutorial. Right, yeah. So this is, this is the first run on uh, downloading a Steam game. And so this is showing us basically is it hit or miss and what chunk are we downloading? So as we go through and download whatever game it is that we're downloading from Steam, uh, ideally we see hit yeah. because that means it's coming from local instead of from over the internet. Right. But these chunks are being cached locally on the NAS as well as being forwarded to this Windows client. And so then the next machine can pull it from the NAS. Yep. So, which is cool because in an unfortunate era where some people, not us, thankfully, but some people do have bandwidth caps from their ISPs. And if you have multiple people in the house who play the same game or mul multiple uh, instances in the office and you're limited on your bandwidth, then this could be useful there as well. So it slices, it dices, it makes julienne fries. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the network attached server. It does everything. <laughs> this, you know, you really should have gone into infomercials. <laughs> Very nerdy infomercials, but infomercials <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> Do you or someone you know use the ButterFS file system? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you need to stage an intervention. No, Call kidding. the hurt line now. <laughs> no, actually, I did test ButterFS a lot for this in like doing my homework yeah. for, for this collaboration, and ButterFS is actually pretty good. I was a little scared off by the whole Unraid, let's DIY the cache mm. thing, ZFS. I trust ZFS. Yeah. So that's the server setup. I think we'll probably, we'll cap this at two parts for this series. Pretty straightforward. There's 
additional stuff I still have to do after you leave to finish configuring it and yeah, tutorials. Yeah, get it usable for us, and it's pretty much there though. And then we have a separate video we've already filmed, but not sure what order they're uploading in, and that is the Epic C the server you brought. Oh yeah, in. so it's 128, 128 cores. cores. And you should definitely check that video out. It's really cool stuff, and the fans spin fast. <laughs> uh, so that's it's a cool demo of linear feet per minute flow. I had a blast putting this together. So thank you for having me out. I'm a very gracious host. It's been awesome. You did all the work. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Check out Level One Tech. Subscribe in the link in the description below to them, and we'll see you all next time.